most of you know, despite this program and the first item, I am not Dr. James Coleman. I am here for the purpose of uh, introducing Dr. James Coleman and also to put in a plug for the Faculty Committee on Public Lectures, of which I am the chairman. The Faculty Committee on Public Lectures is a committee of the faculty which has a number of functions. One of these functions is the sponsorship, the arranging for, of two lecture series, one in the fall and one in the spring, the faculty lecture series. This is, each of these is a series of talks by members of the faculty to the general public as well as the immediate academic community on a single theme. It's our purpose to show off the UCLA faculty to itself and to the general public. In the past, the topics have varied from the uses of leisure to Shakespeare to integration as well as a number of others. This tradition of faculty lecture series, if the practices of several years can amount to a tradition, seems to me to be in good hands tonight with the series which we have scheduled. That is the African drama, The Building of Nations. It's also been the custom in years past for the chairman of the Faculty Committee on Public Lectures or for the member of the committee who has been responsible, primarily responsible, for putting this show together to introduce the series. But tonight we have been very fortunate in getting an introducer who really knows the subject. And I refer to Dr. James Coleman, who is both professor of political science and the director of the African Studies Center on this campus. Dr. Coleman is, not a, is an internationally recognized authority on Africa, not only from his books and publications of various kinds, but also from having created on this campus what is perhaps the best African Studies Center which can be found anywhere. He has been the past president of the African Studies Association and now is Vice President of the International Congress of Africanists, which I think is the highest office which can be held from one who does not at least reside in Africa. We are very fortunate to have him to introduce the series tonight for two reasons. One is because of the nature of his interest, Jim is frequently out of town, and out of town to him means Nigeria, Addis, Dar, and all the other Ex to me, exotic places in Africa. And he is here tonight with us. We're even more fortunate that this is so because he is, in fact, the best man, the best qualified man, to introduce this series, the African drama, The Building of Nations. Dr. Coleman. Thank you, uh, Professor Shorts. Um, a new convert to Africa, incidentally. He uh, has made a trip there, and we hope that this is going to be not a weekly affair, but at least once a year. The, the African drama, which is a nationalist explosion, certainly raises certain fundamental questions about uh, the nature and destiny of nations. It raises, uh, once again, the question, is the national community, the nation state, of what Rupert Emerson has called the terminal community. Is the nation state um, uh, the effective end of the road, the highest form of human organization beyond which man cannot reach? Um, is this statement by a recent French uh, specialist on the subject true? In our world, it is still a citizen of a national state that one is oppressed or liberated. Uh, willy-nilly, one lives the destiny of one's nation. Well, if this cosmic question can't be answered by the contemporary African drama. What it has contributed uh, has been um, a demonstration anew that, at least for our epoch, the nation-state is the um, highest form of human organization and fortified as it is by internal sovereignty and by the whole structure of international law and organization. But perhaps we should address ourselves to the even more fundamental question of what is a nation. 
uh, philosophers and patriots and scholars have debated this uh, question endlessly with no agreement. It reminds me of an article written by one of my former colleagues, Professor Titus, on the number of definitions of a state. He found, I think, 145. Well, I think you can find the equivalent number for a nation. But they roughly fall into two categories. You define a nation objectively by it being a human group that has a shared culture, a shared history, a common language, frequently a common religion, uh, certainly a common history. And yet when one applies these objective criteria to uh, the existing nations in the world, they all fall short. They don't answer. One finds many places where these do not exist and you have what everyone recognizes as nations and vice versa. Well, the question has been raised most recently, is Canada one nation or two? And uh, I think one could go around and, and, and find this very perplexing and vexing question uh, many other places in the world. But there are the other types of definitions. You define a nation as a group of people who feel themselves to be a nation. However they came to feel that way, if they can demonstrate that a sufficient number amongst them, you might say the politically relevant elements, feel that they constitute a nation, a nation exists. Of course, one can step back and say that where you have these other objective factors like a common history, a common culture, a common language, and so forth, you're more likely, possibly, to find this subjective feeling of nationhood, but not necessarily so. The decisive fact is when a group of people feel themselves to be a nation, then this raises how many people. And how do they demonstrate this feeling? You can't take um, a poll, at least it's not very convenient, it's quite expensive, and they haven't yet developed the methodology for this. It's really only at the crisis points when people are, uh, come to feel there, at this moment at least, there is an embryonic nation. And this is true of much of what is called the non-Western world or the developing areas. It's only at the crisis points that one can sort of say, yes, there, there is a Ghanaian nation, or no, there is not yet a Congolese nation. Or at the time of the Indonesian Revolution, when it was victorious, yes, at that crisis point, this is evidence that there was sufficient feeling among the politically relevant groups that you had a nation. This has been true throughout history. Well, <clears throat> Looking at these two sides, uh, one is led to ask, uh, are there African nations? And until recently, the external world made the judgment no. Not only on grounds of the um, prejudiced image that the external world had of the uh, capacities of the African peoples to govern themselves, and even well-meaning people had this belief. It was summed up in the phrase in the League Covenant and carried over. Peoples not yet able to stand by themselves under the strenuous conditions of the modern world. And there was in a document that at the time was considered a quite liberal and advanced. Not only was there a question about the lack, a feeling of lack of capacity for independent nationhood, there's a genuine feeling that there's a lack of the objective conditions that defined a nation. I go back to the objective definition. And here I'd like to make just two very quick quotations that I've rather overused, but I think they illuminate by rather prominent personalities who, uh, the, the image that the external world had of the potentiality of African nations. One is by Miss Marjorie Purim, which is frequently used, and she's currently the president of the British Africanist Association. And so one must give some attention to what she said. It's true she said this 20 years ago, but this is itself illuminating of what existed in the minds of men at that time. In contrasting Africa to Asia, she says, one finds in Africa the multicellular tissue of tribalism, 
uh, instead of an ancient civilization, the largest area of primitive poverty enduring to the modern age. Until the very recent penetration by Europe, the greater part of the continent was without the wheel, the plow, or the transport animal, almost without stone houses or clothes, except for skins, without writing, and so without history. So there was no cultural basis here for nation, uh, fragmentation, multilinguality. There was no historical basis, because there was no history in this interpretation of history. And there was no resource base to support independent nationhood, the world's most extreme form of poverty. Well, again, the great historian who can look at things all in almost cosmic fashion, and one would uh, think he could embrace Africa within the sweep of history, Mr. Toynbee, refers to uh, the spread uh, throughout the non-Western world of what he called the late modern Western political institution of national states. And it is spread in regions where national states um, are not part and parcel of an indigenous uh, social system, but were an exotic institution which is deliberately imported from the West, which seemed to be singularly um, uninformed in this judgment he made of how nation states in Europe came into being. It's a question of history. But more than this, there was not only a feeling that there was an absence of an objective basis for nationhood, there was further an absence of a subjecting feeling of nationhood that would coalesce around what we now see as the new nations of Africa, or what used to be the colonial territory. And here we come to a more recent statement by, by Lord Haley, who was author of the monumental work An African Survey. And he addresses himself to this issue. In turning to Africa, it seems advisable to give prominence to use of the term Africanism rather than nationalism. In Europe, nationalism is a readily recognizable force. But the population of most of the countries of Africa consists of people who have brought, been brought together under one form of government by the accidents of history. They have no tradition of a common origin, nor a common outlook on their political future. Nor a common outlook on their political future, the subjective definition of nationhood. Uh, this also was uh, presumably absent. Well, despite these uh, appraisals and judgments about the absence of both objective and subjective bases, we do confront today in Africa more than 30 new uh, embryonic nations that are being created by the new states that have emerged from colonialism. And so we move really to a third, and I still think at this stage, unanswerable question one of these fundamental questions that the African drama raises. Will the nations, the new nations in Africa, be instruments for freedom or for oppression? Well, until now, they certainly have been the instrument, in the absence of any uh, assistance elsewhere, for the removal of the uh, age-old condition of servitude and for winning a freedom uh, that, uh, racially at least, uh, uh, was, of course, tremendously meaningful. Now, our concern is after these nations have been born and have won this freedom, will they use their power uh, under the guise of nation building to introduce new forms of oppression? And, of course, the image of authoritarianism, one-party state, and so forth emerges. But I think before we make any judgment on this, first of all, we should note that this is a rather premature question. Only four years have passed, and it was not quite four years after our own independence that Washington and Hamilton and others were decrying the uh, uh, disutility of an opposition. Um, it's a little premature to judge. What we need is more knowledge, and at this moment, I think, more understanding of the nature of the situation. But secondly, I think another caveat is that we need to keep in mind that historically, most nations of this uh, world have been built uh, through authoritarian or coercive way, means. And that Africa stands in a, a rather peculiarly unique uh, situation in trying to build its nations uh, without this particular element. Well, in any event, this series is not addressing itself to all these uh, rather cosmic questions 
But I think many aspects of them will be brought into focus. And as you know by the titles of the, lecture, of the lectures that are being given subsequently, there will be an examination of uh, the historical and the cultural bases of uh, African nationhood, the, the physical environment and what it can contribute to the building of new national states. And then finally, Dean Wilson will turn in the last lecture to a discussion of the primary instrument of nation building in practically every modern state, the educational system. And it's probably the educational system of civic, uh, building of civic consciousness that built the American nation, and this may be the, the case in Africa. But tonight we're happy to have with us uh, Professor Sylvester Whitaker, who is going to um, speak on um, uh, African nationalism in general and some of the implications it has for America. Uh, we, Professor Whitaker happily joined us from Princeton where he was a lecturer in politics and where he obtained his uh, doctorate after doing research in Nigeria. He's currently a member of the Department of Political Science and Associate Dean of the Graduate Division and is extremely well qualified to talk to this subject. Professor Whitaker. I suppose like all titles, um, this one is deceptive in, in that it hides a number of complexities and facets which at uh, first sight it not, might not seem to present. And, uh, and in this case, uh, the complexities that it hides, uh, I find I brought on myself uh, in that um, I was the one who chose the topic, and in doing so, I. Uh, I had in mind, since I was asked to speak on the implications of African nationalism for America, um, I had in mind uh, ringing a switch uh, on uh, some of what appeared to me to be the tighter cliches that uh, have adorned the titles of books about Africa, such as uh, Africa, um, A Waking Giant, and uh, Emergent Africa, uh, and so on. It uh, seemed to me a nice idea to um, uh, have uh, the title uh, American Awakening to suggest the, the fact that there uh, were quite fundamental challenges which African nationalism presented not only to Africa, uh, but to this society. Uh, the difficulty, however, was that the, the more uh, having uh, formulated the title, I had tried to address myself to the content or what it seemed uh, should be uh, covered uh, uh, in the content uh, that I became aware of its deceptive nature. Um, in the first place, I realized um, that uh, African nationalism might be regarded or might, uh, one might try to discover what impact it's had on uh, the American official view uh, towards Africa. And I realized immediately it would be necessary to make some kind of distinction between the American official view and the non-official view. Uh, next, I realized that um, uh, it was certainly uh, necessary to distinguish between American Negroes' views of Africa and the impact on those views of, of African nationalism is distinct from other Americans because it seemed to me quite clear it was no, it was no good pretending uh, that those views and reactions were identical. Uh, and finally, uh, I realized that um, uh, it was probably appropriate uh, to uh, address oneself um, to the, the whole question of uh, what, uh, if anything, uh, might be constructively uh, changed in terms of American foreign policy uh, uh, towards Africa. And uh, also, uh, I suppose, uh, it also uh, eventually occurred to me that um, African nationalism might have uh, altered uh, the American view not only of Africa, but of other areas in the world. Um, and um, then to make matters worse, I realized that uh, a great deal of the title sort of suggested a kind of evaluation, appraisal, uh, in the sense of, of what, um, what ought American policy to have been and to be. Uh, and uh, I realized at that point that, in addition to everything else, a uh, great danger <clears throat> was that um, most of what I might have to say on that subject would seem stale and unprofitable. 
Uh, I was uh, struck uh, and tempted to reproduce the opening statement of a recent book on, uh, on Africa, um, which uh, reads, for readers who are weary with expostulations uh, about the failure of America to rise to the challenge of our day, should please skip this book. And I <laughs> felt uh, that uh, it might be an appropriate uh, part of the uh, publicity for my own lecture. Um, with all of this, I can only uh, conclude finally that um, I was able to avert uh, being overwhelmed by challenge, by uh, panic, uh, only by um, uh, reminding myself uh, of an ambition to Stoicism, which uh, a philosophy professor once infected me with. Uh, he uh, insisted, however, that um, a, a, a true Stoic was not content simply to acquiesce in reality, but to make a positive adjustment to it. When life hands you a lemon, he used to say, the true Stoic makes lemonade. <laughs> Clearly, the sweetness in this topic, so far as I'm concerned, uh, lies in the very impossibility of dealing with it, I think, comprehensively. And so uh, I uh, have relaxed into, or relapsed, uh, into uh, the decision to uh, limit my remarks uh, to what constitute reflections on very limited aspects of the uh, various issues uh, suggested by the topic. Let me begin uh, by um, referring back to Professor Coleman's opening remarks. Uh, I should have known that uh, Professor uh, Coleman uh, would have anticipated um, uh, what I had to say about uh, the nature of, of nationalism and how it uh, related to African nationalism. And um, particularly, uh, it seems to me that his drawing attention to the true two, uh, two to two traditions of um, uh, thinking about and analyzing the phenomena of nationalism. One, the focus on so-called objective factors, and on the other hand, uh, the uh, focus on subject subjective uh, factors um, existed, and uh, that from the point of view of uh, African nationalism. Uh, one was um, left puzzled from either approach uh, as to whether uh, the African situation uh, really did constitute a, uh, uh, a, uh, a nationalist uh, upsurge or whether, as suggested in uh, Lord Haley's description, it really ought to be considered as something quite uh, uniquely uh, uh, different, uh, Africanism rather than nationalism. Um, I suggest that these true traditions of uh, focusing on nationalism uh, have certainly tended to obscure uh, our comprehension of what is involved in the African case. Uh, on the one hand, I should think that if we sought to um, uh, limit our um, appreciation of the relationship between nationalism and Africa and uh, the experience of the of similar of the same phenomenon elsewhere, we certainly should go amiss by uh, um, uh, deciding to um, uh, use as our uh, operative criteria objective uh, factors such as language and common culture, uh, common history, um, uh, and so forth. Uh, because uh, one or the other, and, and most altogether, of the African uh, nations uh, lack such objective bonds, uh, 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 which um, as conditions uh, of, of their uh, pursuit of nationhood. And on the other hand, uh, it seems that um, the kind of uh, mystic approach which underlies, for example, Professor Hans Cohen's treatment of nationalism, uh, which he uh, ends up uh, by defining as or talking about um, a spirit which breathes itself into the 
a nation uh, and into a people at uh, some uh, crucial juncture in time uh, is uh, likewise um, unsatisfactory. But it does seem to me that um, the, um, you know, the, perhaps the beginning for an understanding, I shan't attempt a definition, um, but I think it seems to me that the uh, beginning of an understanding of uh, nationalism and its affinity for uh, what we've called nationalism in other countries is that uh, the uh, seems to me the departure, the point at which uh, the, the uh, uh, people began, begin to behave in a way that we associate with the term uh, is a basic alteration uh, in in, uh, in their environment. And by environment, I mean their psychological environment as well. And particularly, I mean that, that juncture at which uh, people uh, begin to feel for the first time deprivations which have, they have not felt before or aspirations which they have not felt before. And it seems to me this, uh, and usually, uh, and certainly in the African case, the two things have gone hand in hand. They have felt newly deprived and have felt new uh, ambitions, new, and new goals uh, simultaneously. Uh, and it is the proposition or belief that these new deprivations may be alleviated or these new aspirations fulfilled through the uh, nation state or the belief of at least enough people that the nation state is the appropriate context in which to uh, bring about um, the um, uh, resp response to new deprivations and new aspirations. Enough people believe it to, uh, who are in a position to do something about it. It's at that point, it seems to me, that one departs uh, into nationalism. And it's at that point, it seems to me, that we uh, should perceive the uh, beginnings uh, of the phenomenon in Africa. Now, I think that uh, it's perfectly clear that a good deal of uh, the uh, nature of those deprivations and aspirations in the African case um, have been shared by others and uh, in contemporary uh, context are shared by uh, most of the non-Western world. I do think, however, that um, for uh, reasons which I uh, uh, will indicate, uh, it seems to me that uh, the uh, nature uh, of those aspirations and particularly the conditions in which the fulfillment of those aspirations is sought uh, are uh, in, some, in degree, if not in kind, uh, unique to Africa. In the first place, uh, the uniqueness stems from the peculiarly low evaluation which the Western world has uh, always or historically uh, had uh, of, uh, of Africa. Um, and it is this low evaluation which uh, gives to African nationalism its peculiarly psychological dimension. Um, if you, one should uh, question the uh, extent to which this, uh, the, the, what really constitutes uh, Afrophobia uh, has uh, pervaded uh, Western thinking. I think it's only necessary to read books um, uh, on, the, on Africa published by particularly uh, Americans uh, for um, uh, the period uh, uh, up until uh, very recently, I have to say really up until the post-war. And some of these uh, evaluations uh, continue to be asserted. Um, for example, and uh, I've chosen this example um, because it's striking and uh, also because uh, one has not had to go very far, no further than a sister institution, uh, to find it. Uh, thus, in a book published in 1955, and uh, originally published in 1955, and recently republished, uh, re-issued re uh, in this year, in which the same statement which I'm about 
to read is reproduced again. Um, a student of African society writes as follows. Africa is a land with little or no history. South of the Sahara, the indigenous peoples cannot look back on any golden age, on any truly great civilization. Of the 21 outstanding cultures in world history listed by the English historian Toynbee, none is Negro. It, all, it has always been truly said that Africa south of the Sahara has always been poor and powerless. The political and cultural emptiness of the African past is the key to any understanding of the continent's present problems. This generalization holds true despite the efforts of some Negro intellectuals to discover periods of greatness in the African past. The African produced no alphabets, no adequate system of numerals, no calendar or exact measurements, no currency, plow, or wheel. He built few towns and created nothing that could endure. Worst of all, he was a creature of fear and superstition, helpless in the grip of magic and witchcraft. Now, though in one sense, I think that um, a refutation of that uh, statement is uh, undoubtedly beneath the uh, lectures to follow. I should think that um, uh, what they have to say uh, will be of some help in evaluating uh, the uh, adequacy of such a view. For our purposes, I think what's n necessary to realize is that it is against this background of the evaluation of uh, Africa, uh, which uh, that uh, Africans are concerned uh, with uh, the aspiration to, in effect, uh, prove, uh, demonstrate their worth uh, as uh, human beings and their ability to achieve and create uh, in terms of the highest standards which civilization as a whole uh, has always set. Now, how they go about uh, this uh, determination, this is attempt to prove uh, and assert their dignity, I think is not a simple matter. In fact, uh, I think that uh, it uh, contains uh, its own very serious uh, uh, problems and complications, and uh, often these uh, complications uh, are such as to interfere with other aspects of the nation-building process, as I uh, hope to indicate in a minute. Um, I um, am embarrassed to see so many of my students whom I, in, uh, in a class whom I've recently, to whom I recently suggested that to understand uh, the uh, peculiarly psychological uh, nature and the peculiarly, uh, the in peculiarly intense uh, and difficult psychological state uh, in, of uh, contemporary Africans, uh, one uh, could uh, try to imagine uh, a, a second or third generation Italian uh, boy on the streets of New York being taunted uh, for, the, uh, for an alleged uh, propensity for, uh, for, uh, of Italians to consume uh, ex excess amounts of spaghetti. Uh, on the one hand, uh, if he were interested in uh, asserting his dignity in the situation, he might uh, attempt to um, uh, prove that uh, on a statistical basis, um, the consumption of spaghetti by Italians was not uh, disproportionate to other Americans. Uh, and uh, go on to say that, as, in essence, uh, spaghetti was really a, a pretty universal dish uh, and there, therefore nothing peculiar uh, in, uh, Af in uh, the Italian um, liking for it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, he might say uh, that, uh, yes, Italians eat a lot of spaghetti and we're damn proud of it. Well, I think the point about the uh, psychology of African nationalism uh, is that um, not only does it take these alternative forms, but more frequently uh, it takes both forms simultaneously. Uh, they, uh, I think that uh, this is indicated, if, in not, by, if by nothing else, than uh, the peculiar um, uh, fact 
that the uh, primary uh, exponent of the concept of negritude, which constitutes an attempt to, to um, assert certain unique virtues or unique qualities on the part of black or Negro cultures, is at one and the same time uh, the African political leader who is perhaps uh, more deeply rooted in terms of in his experience uh, and uh, his uh, affinity for Western culture than, than any other, uh, the president of Senegal, uh, Leopold Senghor. Now, Senghor, uh, as I say, is, is uh, the uh, person who has been most outspoken in his admiration for uh, uh, Western culture, and particularly its French form, uh, and is at the same time uh, perhaps the most articulate um, advocate of the notion that um, uh, there is something uh, uniquely valuable uh, and uh, uniquely um, uh, peculiar uh, to, uh, to African societies and that that uniqueness uh, is a good thing. Uh, my own experience um, with um, teaching uh, African government and politics uh, with um, uh, African uh, students as members of the class uh, is that the only point that generates as much controversy as one that suggests some fundamental differences between Western and African society uh, is, is one that appears to invalidate the African society's claim to certain uh, uh, unique virtues. And often as not, the objections uh, come from the same quarter. I don't object, I assure you it makes for very lively classes, but um, the, um, uh, I, I think that, that uh, it um, uh, is at least a constant reminder to me that the legacy of uh, Negrophobia, a legacy of the kind of statement I've read, uh, is to create uh, a state of mind uh, and the part of those who have been the victims of it uh, which is, uh, if anything, anything but predictable uh, and often uh, um, uh, very difficult to relate to uh, sympathetically. And I think that this is one of the uh, uh, challenges, if you like, which the uh, phenomenon of, Afri of nationalism in Africa presents uniquely to uh, the American society as a whole. Um, I think that uh, we also have to realize that in the realm of the uh, material uh, uh, objectives of African nationalism, that um, some quite um, uh, special problems uh, are involved uh, in the case of Africa. Um, in the first place, that although um, African countries share with others a, uh, a low uh, economic uh, uh, position and a low standard of, of living. Uh, it's important to realize that among uh, even non-Western uh, non underdeveloped uh, areas, uh, Africa, uh, and particularly uh, here, uh, the black Africa, that is the countries of Africa uh, ruled by, uh, by uh, black Africans and not by Europeans, uh, not by a U European oligarchy, uh, that uh, they, their standards of living place them even within this world uh, at a very low, uh, uh, the very lowest rank uh, on the totem pole. Um, that is to say, uh, the fact that uh, Africa lives in the African countries exist in the world in which approximately 20% uh, of the people enjoy 60% of the wealth, whereas 60% uh, of the people get along on 20% of the wealth, um, uh, is uh, 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 exaggerated, intensified uh, in uh, their case. Uh, and uh, they are uh, in this, uh, even in this uh, ranking, uh, quite uh, uh, low down, quite uh, at, at a uh, economic um, uh, condition of um, uh, of poverty, uh, even compared to uh, other areas, uh, other non-Western areas. 
Uh, furthermore, uh, I think that, again, as Professor Coleman sort of hinted uh, in the beginning, uh, one of the uh, unique uh, problems which uh, African nations have undertaken is to uh, attempt to overcome both the psychological and material aspects of their uh, situation through uh, essentially democratic forms. And uh, despite the fact that um, one has witnessed in recent years, uh, particularly in the years since uh, uh, the, the independence, the upsurge of independent uh, nations in 1960, uh, a um, a uh, quite pervasive drift to the single party system in Africa. Despite that fact, uh, African governments still, uh, and even those single party governments, operate uh, under very uh, significant uh, uh, restraints which we associate with uh, uh, democratic and liberal uh, government in the Western world. Uh, none of them, for example, have uh, attempted to uh, alter the basic framework of uh, due process of law and basic uh, civil liberties uh, within the country, apart from the uh, formal, the, the acceptance of formal opposition. But um, the more significant, it seems to me, more striking fact uh, about African uh, uh, nations uh, is that uh, they have uh, accepted to accomplish uh, their, the goals of nationalism uh, under, uh, within a framework of, uh, of human liberty and spontaneity. They uh, have um, uh, seldom, and to a very, uh, I think, uh, very strikingly uh, uh, small extent, uh, embraced essentially coercive techniques uh, of government and especially when we compare it uh, with, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, comparable periods uh, w within the Western uh, experience. Uh, I often remind uh, the, uh, my classes of the connection between uh, Daniel Defoe's uh, uh, pamphlet uh, on, uh, on poverty uh, in which he uh, points out, in which he, he argues that uh, in order to have progress in society, uh, it was necessary to, uh, uh, to uh, have either coercion in a legal form or uh, more effectively to uh, let loose what he called the silent, unremitting pressure of hunger. Now, uh, I think that, that um, the fact that uh, uh, Africans are uh, involved in uh, the attempt to economically transform their societies at the same time as they attempt to uh, uh, maintain a more or less democratic legitimacy, uh, and uh, thirdly, uh, um, uh, bring about the condition uh, in which uh, supreme loyalty uh, of the individual is owed to the nation state as against all other competitors for his loyalty, uh, that it's important to realize that although these three facets or aspects of the objective or material side of African nationalism uh, are in the long run complementary, the goals are complementary, and indeed they're uh, mutually indispensable, uh, it's impossible, I think uh, there's no prospect that um, uh, nation building in the sense of supreme loyalty owed to the nation state can be brought about uh, if there is not a demonstration of economic progress, nor is it possible, it seems to me, that the governments will enjoy or be able to sustain democratic legitimacy for long uh, if they are subject to uh, a, a um, uh, uh, feeling of failure and hopelessness on the part of people uh, who are attempting to uh, uh, create the material conditions of, of human dignity as they see them in the modern world. That uh, in these sen this sense, although the, in the long run the, go the goals are therefore complementary, I think it's necessary to realize that in the short run, more often than not, 
it is found that the goals are in pursuit of the goals are in conflict, that one can only bring about uh, one, or one can only maximize the attainment of one by minimizing uh, the pursuit of the other. And uh, this shows up in, in uh, 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 many, many ways and in many contexts uh, in uh, African politics. Um, for example, uh, it's um, one of the really great difficulties facing African, uh, the, the nation building process uh, and uh, the economic development process in Africa. One of the great contradictions is that um, uh, by uh, virtue of the fact that um, historically the areas of Africa initially exposed to Western influence and hence to uh, uh, commercial uh, development and to participation in the international market system, in short, those areas which are most economically developed already uh, are, um, uh, uh, are, are areas uh, which uh, naturally tend to draw the greatest degree of, um, of, of uh, economic assistance and investment from abroad and that um, although from an economic development point of view, uh, this uh, investment or assistance of the more developed area uh, makes a great deal of sense and economically might even be regarded as beneficial to the country, uh, the countries in which it takes place. The fact of the matter is that um, get in the absence of this feeling uh, of uh, nationhood and the absence of having already uh, achieved it, uh, the situation in which one area is economically benefiting in excess of another uh, places very severe difficulties uh, in the face of, uh, of, of the nation building process. So the uh, economic development uh, here, the, the requirements or imperatives of economic development um, can um, only be uh, to a certain extent qualified uh, for the sake of a uniform or uh, even pattern of development, which from an economic point of view is not necessarily desirable. Uh, now, I think that uh, the, um, uh, the na nature of the American relationship to all of this uh, nationalist ferment in Africa uh, uh, is um, uh, very uh, has a very long history, and uh, I think that uh, it has certain, certain uh, particularly, particular uh, uh, challenges uh, in terms of very recent events. Um, I refer here specifically to, uh, I think, the implications of uh, our relationship of Africa, which uh, grow and stem from the um, uh, emergence of the Sino-Soviet split. Uh, and I think that um, uh, it's uh, well to uh, refer uh, to the fact that uh, uh, up until uh, very recently, uh, it was quite difficult, I think, for those who were most sympathetic with uh, African countries and most sympathetic with uh, the notion that uh, America should devote its resources to the um, uh, assistance of the uh, nation building process in Africa and all its aspects, uh, were very hard put to, uh, to come up with um, uh, arguments that were really very persuasive as to uh, why this should take a very high priority in terms of, of national goals. Uh, I remember uh, being uh, told about uh, Professor Herskovitz's uh, experience uh, after he presented a uh, very detailed uh, uh, document to the United States Senate uh, outlining uh, the uh, number of the problems and the shortcomings of American uh, foreign policy in relation to those problems and face Africans, pointing out, that, for example, that uh, uh, the, the, the most pressing need of Africans was for uh, capital, for development, and in this respect, um, uh, the contribution uh, of the uh, of, of America had had been uh, just tragically uh, inadequate. That um, the private investment in in Africa uh, was negligible, and uh, that public uh, foreign uh, aid assistance 
uh, formed only a very small share of uh, total American assistance, and that uh, in both respects, uh, the, um, the whites controlled oligarchical areas of Africa, South Africa, and Southern Rhodesia, and so on, uh, were inevitably favored because of their already existing high level of development, were inevitably favored uh, over the black area, African areas which were most in need and uh, felt the deprivations and, and the aspirations most acutely. Well, I was told that when he was in effect pressed to say exactly why and what sense was it uh, imperative or urgent for uh, America to do anything about it, that um, he was unable to give uh, an argument, uh, any argument which was, uh, which was very impressive uh, to the congressman and which uh, I gather uh, took the form of exhortations to charity. I think uh, that in the perspective of uh, the Sino-Soviet split and what uh, would appear to be a deliberate attempt on the part of uh, uh, the uh, Chinese uh, in, uh, in the relations to Africa to uh, bring about a, in effect, racial alliance and to appeal to uh, uh, African nations on the basis of um, racial, some kind of racial solidarity. I think that um, Professor Herskovitz, or uh, had he, uh, were he uh, uh, here to present his argument again to the United States Senate, might be in a position uh, to be far more persuasive. Um, I think, uh, in other words, that if for those who require uh, to be frightened into charity, uh, the uh, conditions for that fear uh, are, are more than any exist today. And I think particularly if one combines, if one juxtaposes, one puts alongside the one, on the one hand the, um, the, 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 the possibility uh, that um, uh, the African uh, development process is going to be very, very, lo very uh, long uh, and uh, hard, and that probably some of them will not make it, uh, and that therefore a kind of politics of despair within uh, those countries uh, will uh, uh, be uh, something that we're going to have to contend with. That when that is laid alongside the attempt of uh, nations to uh, align on the basis of, of, uh, of color and in reaction to the racialism of the West historically. And thirdly, when that's combined with, uh, I think, the very uh, explosive uh, situation of nuclear technology, uh, which um, uh, has uh, been increasingly uh, uh, increasingly um, uh, pertinent, I think, to underdeveloped countries, then, as I say, the conditions uh, for fear uh, exist uh, in abundance. Um, in this regard, I just would simply like, like to draw your attention to a, um, a study uh, really uh, was published some years ago in 1960 by uh, Professor Harrison Brown of uh, Caltech and uh, Mr. James Reel, which uh, appropriately enough was entitled Community of Fear. And uh, it was a general review of the implications of uh, the development of nuclear weapons. But in one part, uh, he turns to an examination of uh, the situation, which is of particular pertinence uh, to uh, uh, what I've, I've been trying to say. And he points out, and, and I'm uh, uh, quoting, uh, one, that quite apart from achieving independent nuclear capabilities, nuclear arms will almost surely spread to other nations as a result of military alliances. Uh, secondly, it is conceivable that they might be placed in the hands of nations in Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. Third, nuclear weapons can give smaller nations power for waging war, which is all out of portion to their true industrial power. Fourth, the pressures leading to the spread of nuclear weapons and of nuclear military technology appear to be str too strong to be overcome in the absence of a forceful agreement between the present nuclear powers. 
There is no substantial evidence uh, that this will occur. Fifth, the complexities of long-range missiles are such that lags in a missile technology will hinder the development of effective nuclear weapons systems in many countries. But uh, there are other delivery systems which could be used. The submarine, for example, and, and here we come to the chiller, so far I think as underdeveloped countries are concerned, more pedestrian methods such as sabotaging ships or the planted valise or more ingenious methods which cost little or nothing. Now, I think that uh, the definition of uh, the American goal in its relations in Africa could not be put more simply, if more brutally, uh, uh, by in, in terms of the imperative, I think, to uh, deter the uh, combination of a politics of despair and a politics of racialism uh, in Africa. And I think that it's in, these, it's in this context that uh, a reevaluation uh, uh, of the American policy towards African nations uh, is very much needed. Um, I could go on for it was quite some time, I think, talking about the extent to which there have been quite uh, concrete uh, changes for the good so far as this problem is concerned, so far as this perspective is con concerned, in recent years. Um, and um, were I making, uh, were I talking to uh, a different audience, for example, an audience in Africa, I might be inclined to uh, uh, draw, uh, uh, to spend most of the time drawing attention to those hopeful and positive aspects of changes in American policy in recent years. I am not, however, I am here, and I think that uh, uh, it's been particularly, uh, it's particularly um, um, important to, uh, that we all get a, an appreciation, I think, of the areas of American foreign policy which are particularly, um, present particular difficulties uh, in terms of uh, the, this imperative of which I have just spoken. I, of course, more than uppermost, have in mind uh, the policy towards South Africa and the premises uh, of uh, American policy uh, 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 which uh, uh, underlie our orientation there. Uh, we uh, have uh, for a long time, and indeed fundamental to uh, American thought and historical development, have regarded uh, the condition of pluralism or decentralization of power and responsibility uh, as one of the strongest and most desirable and most cherished of American tradition. And so far as um, uh, the uh, role of uh, private um, enterprise and private firms are concerned uh, in the realm of foreign policy. This has meant that uh, we have thought it uh, appropriate to uh, 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 allow them uh, what amounts to complete, virtually complete autonomy uh, in the pursuit of their normal economic uh, interest uh, in various parts of the world. Uh, I think that it's uh, I've already uh, alluded to the uh, shortcomings of that policy with regard to Africa generally in terms of the, what I would call the faint-heartedness of, of American capital when it comes to investing uh, in Africa. Uh, although, uh, again, there has been improvement, the fact remains that American foreign investment uh, in, um, in uh, Africa south of the Sahara is still negligible and still uh, far below uh, anything which um, uh, it would be adequate to a uh, genuine uh, and, and significant contribution to sustained economic growth. That where one can say, therefore, that in this regard, the, uh, our tradition of reliance on, um, on uh, private uh, sectors of the society to uh, execute our own foreign policy goals is questionable. I think it's necessary to recognize that in the case of South Africa, the policy is potentially disastrous. 
uh, that uh, it is uh, working out to a almost complete negation uh, of what our declared goals uh, in South Africa are. That is to say, uh, it, um, all observers, I think, of uh, the South African scene are agreed on several conclusions. One is that a uh, voluntary um, uh, abandonment of the policies of apartheid uh, is not uh, likely and uh, it does not uh, seem to be uh, 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 one which uh, we, one could, can even reasonably expect in light of the declared uh, aims of uh, the South African government and their uh, uh, active, com active uh, commitments to building up the conditions in which uh, any uh, such, any claim to, uh, uh, or any, any opposition to uh, apartheid uh, is brutally suppressed. Secondly, and they agreed, I think, on the conclusion that um, they only hope of uh, any kind of effective outside pressure uh, uh, is, would have to be uh, either in terms of uh, heavy economic sanctions uh, on the part of the Western nations, and in particularly uh, Britain, particular Britain and uh, the United States, uh, and that failing that, um, the uh, only prospect for change in South Africa is some kind of violent up upheaval, which uh, most people uh, rule out as a really possibility, uh, uh, as really a method of, of bringing about uh, permanent change um, uh, for the good and sufficient reason that so overpowering and efficient is the technology of the South African uh, government that the prospect of um, conducting a successful guerrilla uh, campaign against it on the part of the uh, uh, African masses uh, seems to be very unlikely. So what it boils down to and what our policy uh, towards Africa, uh, towards South Africa has boiled down to is that on the one hand we have condemned the policies of uh, apartheid and um, all of the uh, conditions which seem to accompany that policy. Uh, and uh, we have also, uh, uh, in principle, uh, committed ourselves to uh, trying to bring about the conditions uh, in which uh, the South African government will abandon it. When we come, however, up to the recognition that this uh, whole policy uh, has been uh, in effect systematically, not intentionally, but in effect systematically undermined by the activities of uh, American um, uh, business firms in South Africa, which, for example, appears quite clearly to have rescued, in 1961, to rescue uh, South Africa from a pot potentially um, a disastrous uh, economic deterioration in terms of trade and so on, brought in investment brought about by the revulsion to the Sharpeville riots and so on, that it was at that very moment that Western capital and American capital in particular chose to commit the heaviest uh, uh, investment uh, 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 and then uh, heavier investment than it had ever committed before. And uh, far from uh, having, therefore, brought about a condition which is very difficult for uh, Americans to, for uh, South Africans to continue their policy, uh, they uh, uh, made a very heavy contribution towards a reassurance on the part of South Africans that uh, the South African government that uh, they can pursue uh, their uh, uh, policies without. Uh, danger of uh, economic sanctions, and indeed uh, the South African economy uh, has, as you're probably aware, uh, been flourishing uh, in, in, in recent years. Now, I think that the, uh, the, 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 the challenge, the proof, I think, uh, the, of uh, to Africans that um, America uh, does, is, is willing to do what is necessary to show that a politics of despair and a politics of racialism is uh, not 
uh, inevitable, is going to be presented uh, in the form uh, of uh, a, the, uh, a, a South African, uh, uh, the, the South African situation. I think that uh, it's clear that if that test uh, continues to uh, uh, fail to um, stimulate a um, dramatic reversal on our refusal to impose sanctions on South Africa, uh, the chances uh, of our preventing uh, a, the, the uh, specter which I referred to uh, will be very seriously put in jeopardy. And uh, at the same, and uh, simultaneously, I think that a dramatic uh, uh, stand uh, on uh, the uh, in, in the South African situation would go a very long way towards demonstrating uh, that uh, uh, neither despair nor racialism uh, is an adequate answer. Um, I had wanted to say. Uh, more, I wanted to say something about um, American Negro uh, and American uh, and African relations. Uh, I will not attempt to do it in light of the, the time. Uh, perhaps uh, in the question period to follow, uh, some of you will uh, raise questions which will permit me to make some of the comments uh, that I had wanted to. Thank you, Dr. Whitaker. Uh, there are two traditions to which I'd like to refer, and one which possibly will become a tradition. Uh, the latter is next week's lecture, and that's a lecture by Hilda Cooper, professor of anthropology, on traditional African cultures, the building blocks for new nations, to which you are all cordially invited. The second tradition is that it is customary on the first lecture of a faculty lecture series that following the question period, there is coffee and refreshments in the lounge, uh, which is we shall adhere to tonight. The third is that each lecturer on the faculty lecture series graciously consents to answer questions which you may have with respect to what he has said and sometimes, as Professor Whitaker has indicated, not said in his lecture. And that is the period, so that if any of you have questions with respect to the subject, you are now free to ask them. So, I don't see this. Uh, you were discussing the, uh, the relationship of the United States policy to the African nations, but I wasn't clear about the foundations of this awakening, of the American awakening. In other words, uh, there has been some kind of awakening, and maybe it hasn't been uh, a great enough awakening, sufficient uh, enough awakening. But I think that the, the sources of this awakening are not to be found in any uh, moral awakening, but rather in a, a intense concern with uh, uh, our so-called adversaries, or actually they are considered by the State Department our adversaries, which is the, are the nations of the communist bloc, predominantly the, uh, the Soviet Union. And um, I was wondering if, if you thought that this would be practical or expedient if we use this, this theme of anti-communism to, uh, to promote a greater concern for uh, develop, political development in Africa and for the American involvement, uh, or else can this, can this uh, concern on the part of the State Department and the part of the United States government be based on some other kind of attack? Well, I, I, uh, my own feeling, as I said, is that the, uh, a bipolarization based on ideology pales to significance in terms of its potential horror compared to a bipolarization based on race, racism, uh, and despair at the failure to uh, achieve uh, uh, economic development for uh, societies which are uh, desperately uh, uh, demanding uh, uh, this economic development. I think that it's a far more uh, serious um, uh, motive, if you like, a far more uh, imperative uh, difficulty 
than uh, is created by the, the threat of an ideological penetration of Africa. I think that um, I would agree with those who have attempted, who, who more or less minimize the ideological appeal of uh, communism as a doctrine in Africa uh, uh, based on their uh, readings of African statements and reactions and analysis of communists themselves. In, in most of the, uh, uh, the, the most articulate uh, African political thinkers, for example, have pointed out much of the irrelevance of communist doctrine for uh, Africa, the, the absence of class struggle, for one thing. Uh, and um, I think that, that um, the experience so far has been that despite a very heavy commitment uh, in proportion, proportion to uh, the total foreign aid commitment of the Soviet Union to Africa, uh, that this has brought very little dividends in terms of an ideological uh, identification with communism or, for that matter, a uh, political uh, uh, alignment with the Soviet Union. Well, I certainly, uh, well, I think if that were the case, Africa should have uh, attracted a great deal more capital investment than, than it has. Uh, I think that we can get over, uh, we could uh, no doubt dispute uh, the comparative record of stability in the two areas. But uh, I would uh, reassert that it seems to me that the far more serious uh, shortcoming, a far more difficult problem, uh, is this tendency for uh, capital to be drawn uh, in proportion, into areas in proportion to which they have already uh, uh, brought about uh, achieved development. And that uh, the lower you start off, uh, uh, the lower point in which you start off, the uh, less, uh, less uh, hope for are your chances of attracting that aid. And that's been true so far in private investment. It's also been true of, uh, of economic, uh, public economic assistance. I um, meant to refer, for example, as, uh, as, a, as an illustration of uh, this, this threat of, of profound disappointment on the part of African societies, uh, the, the fact that uh, in uh, precisely those countries which have got economic development plans, which look to uh, American foreign, uh, Western foreign capital, private capital, and to uh, loans and grants, public loans and grants, uh, to uh, carry out uh, that, um, their economic development plans, to, to depend on them to a relatively high degree. For example, in the case of Nigeria, the expectation was that approximately 50% of the capital requirements of their seven-year plan would come from uh, outside and uh, from, from the Western uh, world. And um, the signs are, though most of those countries are, are, are just, have just embarked or have only been embarked for a, a portion of the planned periods, uh, the, 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 all the indications are is that those plans are being very tragically underperformed. Uh, that, um, uh, and I think that this tr uh, underperformance is, um, co is connected with uh, the pressure towards, towards authoritarian uh, 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 drift and towards the very instability to which you refer. For example, last summer, uh, the Nigerian uh, political leaders, who have been rightly, I think, admired in the West for their uh, uh, devotion and adherence to uh, the democratic forms, including opposition, organized opposition, and so forth, um, met and, and uh, obviously were highly tempted, all of them were highly favorable uh, from all reports, to uh, developing, developing uh, instituting a uh, Preventive Detention Act, which would uh, allow the uh, imprisonment of political uh, opponents without trial, as is in the case of Ghana, which we so much criticize. Well, I am convinced myself that this um, uh, impulse to, uh, 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 the, to adopt authoritarian techniques in, Afri in, in Nigeria uh, was very definitely bound up 
with uh, this recognition that uh, it was going to be increasingly necessary to make uh, very heavy demands uh, on the people for, in terms of economic development. It was going to be necessary, for example, to institute savings programs. It was going to be necessary for, uh, to control uh, expenditure on Western consumer luxury goods and so on. All of these sacrifices were going to be uh, demanded, and have to be demanded, if, 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 if economic development was to be brought about. And they recognized that make, in making those sacrifices, they were going to lay themselves open to, uh, uh, to, to precisely to, to, uh, to political instability. They were going to create the conditions in which opposition uh, would uh, 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 very uh, easily uh, bring about the disruption uh, of the country and, and protest against, against those sacrifices. Uh, and I think that uh, the, the, the fact that, as, as they made clear at the end of the conference, the fact that they had chosen at that point not to introduce the preventive detention measure uh, did not in any way commit them, as one of them quite explicitly said, did not commit them to a reconsideration of it. And I think that uh, what we're really going to determine whether they return and what is true here could be said for much of Africa, whether they return to uh, this uh, uh, use of wanting to introduce uh, these repressive techniques of government, uh, will depend uh, upon the progress they make towards the fulfillment of their plans and economic development. And that, in turn, looks like it's going to turn very heavily on uh, whether uh, there is any uh, uh, substantial uh, change in the levels of aid and investment and capital which they receive from the outside world. I was somewhat intrigued by the title of your lecture, The American Awakening. It seems to me that the great mass of the American people is still very deeply asleep uh, as regards the realities in Africa. And I, I think you see this reflected in, well, for one thing, the average American's conception of, of what life in Africa is like today. And this is reflected in the popular press. You have only the turn to Time magazine to see that, that uh, the bizarre aspects of African life are still those which are, which are emphasized. Uh, even in the schools, I've been appalled to see that, that uh, if not the actual story, the, the image of Little Black Sambo is still uh, rather predominant uh, among American school children. Now, I'm wondering what indications uh, you would care to elucidate that there is a true awakening among the mass of Americans, not just those who are particularly concerned, and uh, what media you might suggest for uh, uh, bringing about a true awakening in, in the mass of America. Well, let me be hopeful and optimistic and positive here for a minute. One of the uh, things that uh, I, I think that um, uh, really constitutes a very hopeful sign is the, I'm aware of two separate projects of textbook publishing firms uh, aimed at um, uh, the uh, presenting a uh, dignified picture of Africa and aimed, um, moreover, at uh, uh, giving American Negroes a, an appreciation for uh, the heritage of African culture. Uh, uh, these are, are projects which uh, are on a considerable scale and have, uh, quite, um, uh, have quite substantial resources behind it. And uh, it's uh, clear that in a few years, uh, uh, high schools and primary schools are going to have available to it texts which uh, redress the uh, images of Africa which have been so long prevalent uh, in, in uh, the uh, materials in, in the schools. Uh, and there's no question, I think, that, that uh, it's at the schools that um, uh, at the level of, of the primary and secondary schools uh, which uh, the image of Africa uh, has been shaped in the past. This comes out very clearly in a very intriguing book, which I, again, had hoped to refer to apropos of American-Negro relations with Africa by, uh, a, uh, by Harold Isaacs, uh, called The uh, New, New World uh, of, uh, America, uh, of Negro Americans, uh, very recently published, in which he examines historically and also in a contemporary context in terms of the experiences of American-Negroes who have in recent years 
uh, gone to Africa and what their experiences have been. That uh, one of the things that uh, he goes, he, he presents, I think, very effectively, uh, is the extent to which uh, this uh, very uh, uh, this Negro phobia has been fed by uh, textbook materials in our public schools. And uh, as I say, I think that one of the very hopeful things is that the determination, I think, on the part of, uh, uh, of uh, people who are in a position to redress uh, this uh, tendency uh, uh, to, to uh, be actively concerned uh, with providing the materials uh, which will uh, be, of, be of use. Yes. Could you expand for a minute on the process of getting either of the prospective administrations to institute some kind of sanctions on South Africa? Well, I think uh, here I must return to a pe pessimistic posture because um, it seems to me that in the first place, um, the, the, the root of the problem goes right to the bottom of uh, our whole philosophy in, uh, of um, relationships between government and, and private sectors. And, and I see very little uh, hope that that is going to be uh, uh, altered or brought into question for the sake of South Africa. Um, in other words, I think what's re really required is either is, is an, if, if for economic sanctions. What's really required is for uh, the government to say that to, to um, private corporations um, that um, you know they're free, as McMillan I think uh, said, when they're free to pursue their business uh, as they see it, saw fit. But mind that your business doesn't become mine. Uh, I think you have, one has to recognize and, and it has to be said to them that that their business has become public business, that um, their, uh, their path is a very hazardous one for American society. Uh, and um, short of that, I think that we're left, and as I say, I'm not at all sanguine about that happening. Uh, short of that, um, we're left um, with what um, the situation that uh, Professor Carter describes uh, in, in, in a recent book about American pressures on, about worldwide pressures on, on American policy, in which he points out that, that the American position on South Africa is that economic sanctions uh, are only justified as a, a, a measure to redress a serious breach of, 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 of international peace. Now, the implications for the African, I'm afraid, are, are, are quite brutally clear, that uh, their, their only hope, their only way out, is to bring about a serious breach of international peace. In other words, to, 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 to create some kind of, 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 of threat of bloodbath in South Africa before uh, the United States will consider it appropriate to take uh, the measures which are evidently effective. Now, I, 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 uh, as, as reluctant as I am to come to such a really dismal conclusion, I really see no, no, uh, no other one to, uh, to, uh, to come to uh, in, uh, in light of, uh, of uh, looking at all uh, in, into the South African situation. Yes? Well, I came tonight to get some information to help me teach basic <coughs> geography. We're supposed to teach the Sub-Saharan region. What am I going to take back to my children on the positive angle that the United States has done to the, for the good? <laughs> well, I th as I indicated, uh, I think that uh, it's not that uh, one uh, has no um, no uh, reason to uh, present a more positive picture than I, I have tonight. I admit it um, that I was deliberately going to stress the shortcomings of uh, the American orientation to Africa, but I. Anywhere. <laughs> well, I look, I think that, you see, I, I'm, I'm sorry to be a kind of um, 
Pollyanna, but um, I think that, that, that um, it's no good pretending that, um, you know, that, that um, by a, a kind of um, sudden uh, uh, awareness or sympathy for Africa alone, that this is really going to create a, uh, a basic uh, and effective change in our policy. I, they say the roots of the difficulties go very deep, and, and I think that the sooner we understand how deep the roots go, I think uh, the, the, uh, uh, the more chances uh, there are of really something to be done about it. I think minimizing it and giving only this kind of superficial presentation of what the difficulties are won't help. Let me give you an example in, uh, that, uh, example in terms of, of the trade problems which, which African nations face. Uh, you know, what, we've, what we've said, in, what, what, what they're up against in effect is that uh, in order to get capital, they've got one of essentially four ways. I mean, they can generate capital from savings from within the country. And, and every economist I, I know uh, pretty much rules that out as an adequate source of, of development. And there is no middle class. And countries that are poor, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has um, um, uh, a per capita income of uh, around $100 uh, uh, per capita per year. The, the um, uh, second possibility is, as I say, private uh, capital coming from abroad. And the record so far is discouraging. The, 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 the difficulty is not uh, one of a rapacious capitalist descending on Africa to exploit it ruthlessly. But as I say, that, that American private capital and Western capital when it has been terribly faint-hearted when it's come to, to uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Thirdly, uh, the possibility is uh, that African countries' economies can increase the level of their income by expanding trade and the uh, 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 level of remuneration in the trade. And here, you see, and this is the kind of thing they say which pre prevents me from giving you a kind of easy reassurance, that far from the situation having improved, all the indications are that there is a kind of, is there's a steady deterioration uh, in the trade uh, balances and trade relationships, terms of trade between uh, African uh, countries um, and uh, and the Western world and uh, the a recent um, conference uh, uh, of the um, uh, Economic and Social Commission uh, of the uh, Organization of African Unity uh, met and uh, drew attention and they they put out a very uh, 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 carefully drawn and carefully conceived report in which they point to the fact that uh, as things uh, have gone uh, so far uh, in the uh, period, in the post-independence period, uh, the uh, price of the, uh, what they have to export has been declining, whereas the price of the things, of the imports which they need uh, to pursue economic development, the machinery and so on, uh, have been going up very drastically. Uh, and the result has been that far from there being, as a result of spontaneous international trade forces, an improvement in uh, the uh, position of African economies, that there has been a, st a steadily and very serious decline. Now, one thing is clear, that, again, we have pretty much assumed that um, the spontaneous working out of economic factors uh, would ultimately redound to the benefit of, of everybody involved in the trade, to the West and to the non-West, to the underdeveloped and the developed areas alike. Well, uh, Gunnar Myrdal, some uh, a few years back, made what at the time seemed to be the ra very uh, kind of radical assertion that the, the results of unhampered uh, trade between two uh, countries, one of which was industrialized and the other underprivileged, was the initiation of a cumulative process towards the impoverishment and stagnation of the latter. Now, if you think that's pessimistic or unjustified, just put it alongside of the report to which I referred, uh, in which the, the, uh, the, the, they analyze exactly what has been the pattern and uh, show that precisely uh, the uh, trade situation has been such that, that uh, the, the African and, and the underdeveloped areas in general, and particularly African countries, uh, have um, uh, been able to draw on, uh, to enjoy 
export, uh, income from exports to a far less uh, extent in the last five years than they were in the previous 10. Now, uh, is it the fourth source of development, of course, is to uh, uh, utilize uh, labor uh, to uh, an extent that um, really involves the coercive sweating of labor uh, in the manner of, of communist China. Now, it seems to me that the extent to which we cannot bring about an improvement in one of the other three alternative means of Africa's attracting capital for development, we are simply hastening the day and contributing to uh, a situation in which uh, they will take uh, the, the uh, Chinese communist path, because I think that is much more likely than that they, can't, they will or even can abandon uh, the whole uh, process of attempting to bring about economic development. It really lies that the choice to pursue economic development, as many of the African leaders themselves have made clear, really is beyond their own hands. As Nkrumah put it, uh, I have got to, there's got to be something to show for independence. He doesn't uh, 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 recognizes that the pressure from his own society to, 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 to have something to show, to, 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 to bring about a concrete improvement in the conditions of living of people is an imperative uh, which limits him uh, 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 in, uh, his, uh, uh, in his role and uh, one which if he does not uh, 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 accept, the role that he does not accept, uh, someone else will. So I'm sorry that I can't. <laughs> We dislike closing on a pessimistic note, but the hour is late. On behalf of the Faculty Committee on Public Lectures, I should like to thank Dr. Coleman for his cosmic view of the dimensions and parameters of nationalism, and to Dr. Whitaker for his insightful comments about African nationalism and its relationship to America, and to you for having been such a good audience. And uh, I shall remind you that we do have refreshments in the outer lobby and that uh, we shall see you all here next week. Thank you.